number 2. Let's begin reading this morning in verse number 18. Verse number 18. Keep praying for Miss Carrie as she is carrying that baby. Those babies, I should say. Keep praying. Amen. Keep praying. So she's been sick. That's where they'd been. I told her and and, I, and those that's been out that been working and it's not feeling good. Miss Yvonne had been sick and she's back. So I came back here and hugged her neck and told her I was glad to see uh, her and Kyla and Jasmine and Chastity back. And uh, all of you is important here. Amen. You're important to me. And um, and I'm, I'm not going to have it any other way. That's just how it's going to be. Um, I, I've been in churches before that uh, if you didn't have money or didn't have a name or, or some worldly possessions that you wasn't important to the church. You're all going to be important. Uh, and uh, I had, uh, uh, Miss Butler's not here today. She's not feeling well. But she had quit coming because she had felt they kind of pushed that family to the side. Didn't let them know when they had activities. Didn't let them know anything. I stopped that in a hurry. Uh, and uh, they got them out and got, Tony got right with the Lord and got coming. And so, uh, little Margie got saved here, and now, of course she's with Cindy. But uh, I, we're all in, in, important to the Lord, and we're going to be important here at Open Door Baptist Church. And so I appreciate you making everybody feel welcome here in our congregation. We are many members, one body. Many members, but one body. Amen. All right. Let's begin reading in verse number 18. Of Revelation chapter number 2. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith, and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Verse 23, And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already held, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh, and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations." He shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, shivers, even as I received of my Father. Verse 28, And I will give him the morning star. Then the chapter concludes with verse 29, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I ask you that in Jesus Christ's name that you would help me today. I pray, God, that you would breathe upon me and Holy Spirit of God, you would anoint me, touch me afresh and anew. I thank you, Lord, for the times in my past, Lord, that when I've preached or teached or, or witnessed or sung or whatever it was, Lord, that you've touched me, Lord. I've never forgot those times. But, Lord, I do recall the times where I've tried to do that in the flesh and did not have your touch, Lord. And Lord, how I dropped the ball and how that you were not glorified, Lord. And I, Lord, I ask you, Lord, that today will be a day once again you'll touch me and use me. 
Give me clarity of thought, clarity of speech, Lord. Lord, I want to be a help, not a hindrance. Lord, I want to be a blessing, not a burden. So I pray that you would speak through me, and I'll thank you and praise you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen and amen. By the way of introduction, I would tell you that I felt impressed of the Lord to continue our study on these seven letters that the Apostle John was commanded to write to the seven churches of Asia Minor. This is the fourth letter to the fourth church that we'll be looking at today there at Thyatira. When we looked at the previous three churches, we gave each one a title. If you remember, the church of Ephesus, we said, was a careless church. The Bible said that they were busy serving the Lord and they were on fire for the Lord, but then because of their carelessness, they got away from the Lord and they left their first love. Not that the first love left them, but they had left their first love. The second church we looked at was, of course, Smyrna. Smyrna. Smyrna was a church that had been persecuted. And it deals with the church age when the Christians were being fed the lions, burned at the stake, heads took from their shoulder because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember the Lord said to the church of Smyrna, He said that you're going to have the crown of life. So Smyrna was a crown church. The last church we looked at was the church of Pergamos and how that this church at Pergamos was a church that had allowed the doctrine of Balaam to creep in. We talked about in the book of Numbers from 22 to 23 to 24 how that Balaam had told the king of the Moabites, Balak, how that if he would get the women of the Moabites to intermingle and to inter uh, marry the sons of the Israelites, the Jews, then they would bring in their false gods, their false ways of worship, their paganisms, their heathen ways of worship, and it would ruin Israel. And of course, it did. And so that church was, could be entitled a compromising church. They compromised some of the truths of the Word of God. We, if you remember, I preached while I held a two-edged sword uh, during that sermon and how the Lord said that I'm the one who holds the two-edged sword. I am the Word of God that is sharp than any two-edged sword. He says, I'm there. I'm here to cut away that sin in the church. Now we come to our fourth church, which is the church at Thyatira. Now, if you were to look on a map of Asia Minor, you would first see the city of Ephesus. Then we traveled northward to the city of Smyrna. Then we traveled a little more northeast, to the city of Pergamos, and now we're going down south. We're going more inland to the city of Thyatira. Thyatira was the most inland city of all the seven cities uh, that John was commissioned to write. Now, by the way of just by way of that you will know and have some knowledge of this city, uh, it was the smallest city of the seven cities. But yet, being the smallest city, it was given the longest letter. And we're going to see why it was given the longest letter, the seven letters, although it was the smallest city. It was a city that was founded to uh, house troops. The Roman soldiers had a lot of garrisons here where they would live and they would uh, abide here in this city. It was also not, not only a city that housed many of the Roman soldiers, but it was also a city that was very... Uh, uh, popular when it came to trades and to craftsmanship. And actually, of all the seven cities, although it was the smallest of the seven cities, it had the most tradesmen and the most, most craftsmen that lived, resigned in this city. Now, let's go to verse 18. And, and notice the Bible says unto the angel, <coughs> well, of course, we know as the pastor, the under-shepherd uh, of the church in Thyatira, right? These things saith the Son of God. Now, if you remember in the previous three letters that John was summoned or commissioned to write, that God gave himself a title. 
he described himself. Uh, you remember, if you want to flip back there to the church of Ephesus at the beginning of chapter number 2, he said unto the church of Ephesus, Write these things, He that holdeth the seven stars, and he that walketh midst the seven golden candlesticks. When we come to verse number 8, when the Lord is addressing through John the church of Smyrna, he says, I am him that is the first and the last, which was dead, and now I'm alive. When he addressed the church of Pergamos, he said to this church, he said, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with the two edges. When we come to the fourth letter, to the fourth church here in Revelation chapter number 2, he describes himself, or he entitles himself, or he gives himself, uh, gives them this title of himself as what? The Son of God. Now, there's two reasons that this is interesting to me. Number one, this is the only time in the book of Revelation that you'll find Jesus referred to as the Son of God. Three other times, I believe, two or three other times, he's referred to as the Son of Man. But this is the only time in all of Revelation that Jesus is referred to as the Son of God. Now, you say, well, why is that, preacher? Well, the only explanation that I believe that I could give you is, uh, and this makes it the second reason that's interesting, this title is given, is because in Thyatira, their main god, their head god, was Apollo. And Apollo was the sun god, the S-U-N god. And uh, because of that, I believe that the Lord is saying, I know that you're there in a city that worships Apollo, the sun god. But I want you to know that although the S-U-N is the central uh, ruler of the universe, of the planets, and they all rotate around the S-U-N, but I want you to know I'm greater than Apollo, I'm greater than the S-U-N, I'm the S-O-N, and all things were made by me, and by me all things consist. Amen. And I like that title. Amen. I don't want to say that Jesus was being a little arrogant there because he doesn't sin, but I like the way he put it. He said, I know you're there with the S-U-N, God, but I am the S-O-N of God. Amen. And I'm greater than the S-U-N. Amen. He said, I'm the one that made the S-U-N. Amen. I'm the one that put out that star and the galaxies. And so he says, I'm the Son of God. He says, I, I've got eyes like unto a flame of fire. Of course, we know the S-U-N is just a ball of fire. And uh, the Lord goes on to say, I'm the Son of God, and my eyes are like the flame of fire. That is a picture of him fixing to judge. He not only wants to judge these people, but he wants to purify these people. Fire will, will judge us, and it will also purify us. And he said that his feet are like fine brass. This is the second time in Revelation that Jesus has referred to his feet like fine brass, speaks of judgment. And so this is a very severe message. It is a message of judgment. It is a message of disappointment to these people who were saved by his grace. And so we go on and we read verse number 19. There's two main things that I want us to look at today, and that is, number one, the approval... And number two, the accusation. The approval, and then number two, we'll look at the accusation that God gives towards these people in the congregation of the church of Thyatira. He says there, I, who is that I, was referring back to verse 18 to the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He said, I know your works. He said, and I also know your charity. He says, I even know your service. I know your faith, I know your patience, and I know your works. Now, I, I want to say this, that this was a church that, according to verse number 19, was a very busy church, a church that had a lot of ministries, and a lot of the congregation were involved in different ministries in the church and ministries that were going on outside the church to reach uh, those people during this day of Asia Minor and Thyatira specifically with the gospel of Jesus Christ or, or helping the homeless or those that were hungry and those that were weak and frail and sick and, 
And the Lord says to them, as a body of believers, I know your works. Now, I, I want to say this, and you understand, I hope you understand what I'm about to say, that it's not works and then salvation, but it's salvation and then works. The Bible says, not of works, Titus 3, 5, or, or Ephesians 2, 8, 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3, 5 tells us the same thing, that it's not by our works of righteousness, not what we've done, not what we have done or we could do, but it's by His mercy that He saved us. And so we need to understand that, that these people uh, uh, that He's addressing here uh, at this time are folks that are saved, His children, His people. And He says, I know your works. I know that you've been saved because He was there when it happened. Amen. He said, I've redeemed you. I've bought you with the precious blood of my own body. And I know that you have been busy in these ministries. For the church of our size, we have a lot of ministries. Uh, you think about the ministries that we have at Open Door. And by the way, a church ought to have ministries. But we have the ministry of Sunday school. Uh, I consider that not a part of the Sunday morning service. I consider it a ministry. I believe our Sunday school teachers are ministers at the 10 o'clock hour. And I believe that our mission program is a ministry. The rescue mission services are a ministry. The nursing home, or it be Willow, Willowwood or Four Seasons in Winder, those are ministries. The youth ministry or group or Sunday school class is a ministry. The children's church is a ministry. The Tuesday morning prayer breakfast is a ministry. The church sign is a ministry. And we could go on and on. The preaching and teaching of the Word of God, those are ministries. And we have so many ministries here. And I know I've missed some, but those are ministries of the Open Door Baptist Church that all of us can get involved in, all of us can pray for. And, and, and you say, well, I, I just don't have nothing to do down the Open Door. You're, you're wrong, my friend. you are just got your head in the sand. You get it out of the sand, you'll find something to do around here. Amen. There's ministries, and Jesus says to this church, I know your works. Now, uh, we need to say this. I know there's a lot of preachers that, uh, uh, in the right way, they try to de-emphasize works, and they mainly are talking about works for salvation, as some of these heathen religions will teach you. But here, works is a good thing. It's a positive thing. He said, I know your works. I know what you're doing for me. Can I say to you today, if you're listening to me, if you're listening to me, you need to understand this, that God knows what you are doing for Him, and He knows also what you are not doing for Him. He knows what we're doing for Him. And also He knows what our motive is for what we do and why we do it. He says, I know your works. And then He says, I know your charity or love. That charity speaks of a love that can only be shown by God through us to others. He says, I know your charity. Paul spoke about in Corinthians chapter 13 about charity, how, how precious charity and love is, uh, not only between you and I that are the Christian family of God, but among those that are lost that need to be shown love. They need to see the love of God in our lives. Amen. Can I get some witnesses? They need to see the love of God in our lives. They don't need to see hate. They need to see love. He says, I know your charity. I don't know everything about this, this church or these Christians, uh, but I, I, I can sense here in just reading verse 19 that they were reaching out to help others. Maybe they had a food pantry like uh, we do, and that's another ministry. Maybe, maybe they were able to have a food bank or something, and they would go out and they would help the homeless or, or, or those that were sick. They would have uh, maybe some types of medicine that they had, and they would hand it out, and, and they would help those widows and so forth and children that didn't have clothes. And, and they were loving each other, and they were loving those outside the church. It's a wonderful thing, the, the acts of love that we must show one to another. And he says, I know your service. I know your service. I know your service. I believe that, and you can take it or leave it, but I believe that the reason we have works and then service, you say, well, that isn't basically that the same, but I believe the works there mentioned, first of all, was uh, talking about the work that they did for others and each other. And I believe service here is talking about what they did for the Lord 
we're in the service of the Lord. Amen. We're supposed to serve the Lord. And he says, I know your faith. He says, I know where your faith is, what degree of faith you may have, where you're, what level of faith you're at right now, whether you trust me with all your heart or you doubt me. I know where you are. I know your patience. And I know your works. I mean, so he's approving them of some great qualities, some great characteristics that we all need to examine our heart this morning and see where we are when it comes to our works to others, our works for others. We need to examine our heart and see where we are when it comes to charity and love, how are we when it comes to loving each other in our church, how are we when it comes to loving those outside the church who do not know the free pardon of sin. Then we need to see where we are in our service with the Lord. Why are we doing what we're doing, and are we doing what we should be doing? Are we really doing what we ought to be doing for the glory of God? Then he says, I know your faith. Oh, boy, there's, a, there's an area we all need to get some examination. Amen? We all need to examine ourselves when it comes to faith. He says, then you need to examine yourself about your patience. Oh, let's skip that. We don't want to talk long about patience. Amen? And then your works. But in verse number 20, the Bible in the letter continues. It says, notwithstanding. In other words... You know, I, I, I've approved you. I, I, this is my approval. I know you're busy serving others and trying to serve me. I know you're awful busy down there. But there's something I must say to you. I have a few things against thee. Now, can you imagine if your husband was to come to you, ladies, and was to say to you, uh, Sweetheart, I just want to tell you that I love you and I want to tell you that, boy, you mean so much to me and that uh, you're just a great dad to our children and you, you, really, you really take care of us and help, you know, you, you, you pay the bills and you work hard. And, and, and boy, as a husband, uh, you're hearing this, or as a wife, either way you want to place it, vice versa, you're hearing this and, boy, you're, you're just getting that big head and you're thinking, yes, I am. You're right, dear. About time you recognize that. And then they, they say, yeah, and I just love you, and I just appreciate you, but nevertheless, notwithstanding, I've got a few things against you. Amen. Amen. Boy, that, that wouldn't go well, would it? That would go over like a lead balloon. It just wouldn't happen, would it? And then you say, well, I know. It's just amazing that the Lord would build them up and say, boy, I, I'm proud of your works and your charity, and I appreciate your service and your faith, your patience, but you've got some problems. Well, the reason for that is because God is true. God is just. God is informing them as He's wanting to inform you and I today that no matter what we do in the church, no matter how much we go to church, no matter how much we give of it, finances of ourselves, energy, time, effort, whatever we do and how much we do, that if we still have sin in our heart, God will not overlook it. Because I'm the pastor of an independent Bible believing sin, hating, devil stomping church, doesn't mean that God is going to overlook my sin. Because you lead singing, or because you work in the PA, or because you sing songs, or because you teach children, or Sunday school, or whatever you do, God says, I appreciate you doing that. I appreciate you coming up to bat the ball. But let me tell you, if there's sin in your heart, if there's something there that shouldn't be there, I'm going to let you know about it. I believe real Christians want to know what God knows about their own heart. They want to know where they need to get right. They want to know. Real Christians that are really wanting to get close to God, they want God, even though it's a hard time in their life, conviction is never easy. Conviction is when you no longer say, hey, man, but you say, oh, me. That's what conviction will do to you. Hey, man. Then the people sing, we all, hey, man. Then the preacher preaches, and we go from, hey, man, to, oh, me. Hey, man. That's conviction. It's not an easy thing. It's, it hurts. It, it, that sword pierces our heart, as we talked about in the last letter to Pergamos there, how he's a sharp, the Word of God is a sharp two-edged sword. And we need to understand that no matter what you're doing in the church, no matter what position you hold, the Lord is saying to this congregation, as he has preserved it for you and I today, so that we might understand, no matter what you've done, no matter what, how much you're doing at the church, if your heart's not right, God is disappointed. God is not pleased. This was a letter of severe warning. This was a letter 
that was preparing them to get right or get judged. Get right or get judged. A very busy church. This church was not a lazy church. A very busy church. But yet, with all the different ministries that did not prove that it was a holy church. Are you with me today? Listen to me. A busy church, a church with a lot of ministries, but it did not prove that they were a holy church. Amen. There's a lot of what we, I call them community centers, social buildings, social groupings, social gatherings, and they've got all kind of ministries, and they minister to this and minister to that. They do all these ministries, and yet that does not prove that they're a holy church. That does not prove that they're a church that is doing what is right and their heart is right. Uh, there's a lot of people that today that are saved. They're away from God. They know they've been redeemed. They're going to go to heaven just as sure as I'm going, as you're going, just as sure as the Lord's there. They've been saved. Nothing can change that. But they've got away from God. And yet they're busy doing things in the church or for others outside the church. But yet that does not prove that they're holy and pure people. Amen. Working for the Lord. Watch this now. Working for the Lord is good, but it does not make you holy. Amen. Think about it. Doing works for God does not make you holy. Amen. Repenting of your sins, confessing those sins, turning from those sins, and back to the Lord is what makes you holy. These people were serving, but yet they were also sinning. They were serving but also sinning. And I'm telling you, we're living in the day and age where many church members are on the pew of a church, and yeah, they've been busy doing things at the church and for the church members and other people, and they're serving, and people magnify them. They lift them up and say, Thank God for brother so-and-so that they did this. And, and I believe honor to whom honor do, tribute to who, who tributes do. But yet they know in their heart, yeah, they're serving, but they're also sinning. And those two don't go together when it comes to pleasing the Lord. And so he says that to them, and he says it to you and I, I'm glad you serve me, but yet if you serve me with the wrong motives, your service will be hay and stubble, and it will burn up one day in the judgment seat of Christ. So this is a, boy, a, 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 a letter that you and I need to take to heart this morning. A severe warning that, yes, you can be busy serving, but you better make sure your heart is right with me. I, I, I'm going to say this as your pastor, and, and, and we have the, the sermon order has been growing, and, and so many other people will hear this sermon, and uh, we may even go, be going live for too long. But I'm saying to you, uh, who, whether you be here or be out there, I'm saying to you that, that you can do all the serving you want to do. You can be involved in all the ministries of the church. You can do all that. But if your heart's not pure, if your heart's not right with God, that service is in vain. You serving God will not forgive you of your sins. Serving God does not forgive you of sins. Only repentance can do that. And this church was busy serving, but they were also sinning. Now notice what he says there in verse number 20. He says, notwithstanding. He said, I've got a few things against thee, because thou sufferest, or thou is willing, thou turn your head, like the priest in that the story of the uh, Good Samaritan. You've turned your head, you've let it go. You've suffered that woman, Jezebel, now, this is not the actual Jezebel, Ahab's wife here. This is, he is uh, entitling this woman, describing this, this, this woman, which is a, a doctrine. It is a, uh, a, a false teaching, which called herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, you, you need to understand this. 
Earlier I said that Thyatira was a city known for two things. Number one, it was known for its garrisons of its soldiers, how that it was founded to be a city to house soldiers of the Roman Empire. And second of all, it was known for being a large trade city. A lot of craftsmen and tradesmen uh, lived in this city. One example is Lydia. You remember Lydia in the story of Acts where Paul led her to the Lord. Lydia, the seller of purple, was a Thyatiran seller of purple. She was a tradeswoman from this same city. And trades, uh, tradesmen, tradewomen, craftsmen, craftwomen, whatever it was, uh, lived in this city. It was very important to this city. Well, because they had so many trades, trades and tradesmen and craftsmen and different skills and laborers, they had societies or they had organization, trade organizations. And in order for you to make the income you needed to make or to become prosperous or even to, uh, 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 to pay your bills, you had to be part of a trade organization, a trade uh, 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 committee or trade group. And what happened if these shopkeepers and these trademen uh, were not part of a trade organization, they risked loss of income. And what would happen in these trade organizations, in these trade meetings they would have, they would eat food that would be uh, dedicated to not only the god Apollos, the, the sun god, but to other false deities. And so these Jews that were Christians... These people in the church of Thyatira, they had to make a living. And yet Satan said, I'm going to use it against them in order for you to, to make any money. You're going to have to be part of these trade organizations or these trade uh, uh, groups. And once they got in these groups, they would have a meal for their meeting. And the meal was always dedicated to some false deity. And then that sacrificed meat would be eaten. And that's why the Lord says here, He says that, some of you have, for the sake of business, the sake of being popular, the sake of making a buck and becoming rich, you have joined these satanic trade organizations and you've sat in their meetings, their business meetings or, or whatever meeting it was, and you have sat there and you partook of food that was sacrificed and it was dedicated to some false god and you have ate that sacrificed meat. He says, because you say, you're say, you say that you are part of the church, you say you're a Christian, but yet there you are down there in those lodge meetings, there you are down in those uh, trade meetings, and you're partaking of their heathen practices. And the reason you're doing that is so that you can compromise the truth, what you've been taught, so that you might become rich. And they got God upset. He says, y'all are intermingling, y'all trying to say you love the Lord, but you're straddling the fence. You're trying to be part of some group, and you know this group is anti-Scripture. It's anti-God. And God says, I do not play that game. So you've got to understand these men and women that stood strong, which we'll see here shortly, they were losing income. They were losing business. And a lot of these meetings also partook in emperor worship. They would have a time where they would worship an emperor. And if you were part of that trade organization or that trade uh, 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 business or whatever, and you was part of that uh, group of tradesmen, then you must worship the emperor. And so thank God there were some, not all, but there were some that stood up and said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to worship the Lord God, and besides Him, I will worship none other. Amen. And so God's dealing with those that have, have, they're trying to serve. They continue to work with the Thyatira Baptist Church sign. They continue to put messages on the sign, but when they leave there, they run down to the trade meeting. And they know that in that trade meeting, they're going to eat meat that is dedicated to a false deity to a false god. And they know they're going to have to eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols. 
And yet they'll say, well, I, I just don't want to offend nobody. I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings, and i got to have a job, preacher. You know what they were putting their trust in? Not in God, the S-O-N, but they were putting their trust in their abilities. They were putting trust in their capabilities, in their skill and labor. And got God upset. God said, this straddling the fence has gone far enough. Can I get some amens today? Are you listening to me? Are you with me today? We're in a day and age where the churches are filled with people that are compromising the truths of the Word of God. They say they're Christians. They say they love God. But yet, for the sake of not hurting someone's feelings, for the sake of having as many friends as they can have on Facebook, they're going to do a rumor book, I should say, they want to not offend anybody. They'll do what they need to do, and if someone has a different belief, then that's okay. If they don't believe what the Bible preaches and teaches, then they're not going to say anything. They're not going to hurt anybody. They say, well, I'm not supposed to be a judge. You're supposed to be a fruit inspector. And I'm going to preach one day on, that word, on those two words, judge not, because a lot of folks have took it out of context. You, don't, you need to see who Jesus was talking to. If you want to study it, he's addressing hypocrites. He wasn't addressing you and I, those that are saying. He was addressing hypocrites. Paul said to the righteous man or the righteous judges all things. If you want to live for God and hang out with the right people, you better have some judgment judgment uh, in your mind, in your heart, some spiritual discernment, or you're going to mess up. And these people didn't want to hurt nobody's feelings. They, they wanted to keep as many friends as they could. They had, to make a mon- they had to make money. They had to make the business grow. And so they were compromising the truth. But yet at the same time, they would leave the meeting and they would go down to the nursing home and they would lead the nursing home residents in singing. They were compromising. They were trying to hold hands with God and hold hands with the world at the same time. The problem is that they were suffering. Because God was going the right way and the world was going the wrong way. They're not walking together and they were suffering. They were in chaos. They were in agony because they were trying to hold with God and they were trying to hold with the world and they were being stretched. God says it's not going to work. It's not going to work. He says here, He says that you've suffered that doctrine, that woman Jezebel. Jezebel to come in there and to teach this compromising doctrine. Look what it says in verse number 21. You and I know that Jezebel was a queen of England. Her husband was King Ahab. They was a wick, they was they was wicked, wasn't they? They were wicked. Wicked people. Uh, People don't call their children Jezebel, their daughters Jezebel, because just the name is satanic. Just the name is, you know, that it's it, probably the most wicked woman in all the Bible was Jezebel. And a wicked lady. And she, she harmed Israel. She destroyed Israel by allowing the worship of Baal to come into Israel. She promoted that. And Ahab, who was a, a wimp of a husband, allowed her to do what she wanted to. Basically, Ahab was the king, but Jezebel did the ruling. That's basically what happened. A lot of marriages are like that today. Amen. You can take that for free, but that's just the truth. It's a shame that the women have to be the spiritual leaders. Amen. Are you hearing me today? Look at me. I'm not done preaching. We're not praying yet. Look at me. It's a shame that the women have to be the spiritual leaders in the home. It should be the men. Amen. The men. Amen. And God allowed. God said, "This woman come in here and brought this doctrine that's been been going on since the early days, the days after uh, Moses, uh, during the days of King Ahab and this wicked King Jezebel. How she brought in the false worship of Baal." And He says to them, He says, "Don't, don't you think? Don't you dare think that I don't know what's going on." Sometimes we think we got God fooled, don't we? God won't know. Look at verse twenty-one. Verse 21, and I, who's I? The same I in verse 19, the Son of God. And I, the Son of God, gave her space to repent. That blows my mind, Brother Bobby. As wicked as Jezebel was, as vile and wicked as Jezebel was, 
and as vile and wicked as these people during this age at the church of Thyatira that were practicing this same religious nonsense. They were practicing this sin against God. God in His mercy says, I gave them space to repent. Well, that blows my mind. What a merciful God. Where would you be at today if God hadn't gave you space to repent? Where would you be? I try to, when I have my dealings with, with whether it be my family, other folks, or with the church as a pastor, I've always tried to use that phrase to govern how I act towards people. They need space to repent. We like to jump all over somebody immediately, chew them up, spit them out, criticize them, knock them down. We've got to give them space to repent. Pray that God will help them get right with Him and right with you. Amen? But notice that in the same verse where there's mercy, we also see there's judgment. She repented not. God says, I, I gave her time, and his time was sufficient. God was not unfair to Jezebel or to these people that were living this way. God's not unfair to you and I. When we get away from God, he's fair to us. He's true and holy towards us. And he gives us time to repent. We'll go to church, and, and it may be the Sunday school teacher, it may be the pastor will preach or say something, and they don't even have any idea what you've been involved in, but God spoke through him or through her, and you get convicted. What, are you, what is that? That is space to repent. You have a little accident, or, or you know something could have went worse than what it did, and you, even though you're away from God, you know in your mind, God has given me space to repent. But if you continue to go without God, and you continue to not repent of that sin, and you decide as Jezebel did not to repent, the Bible says that he will do as he has done to all those others. He will judge you. He will judge you. Verse 22 says, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. He says, I have no respect of persons. If you decide to keep on sinning and living away from me, whether we consider it a small little sin or a big sin, it's usually the little sins that continue to grow and continue to get us away from God because we put a little emphasis on it. We don't think it's a big deal. We put a little emphasis on it. He said, if you continue to go that way, he says, and you don't repent, he says, I'm going to judge. What a severe warning to not only this church, but to this church and to all those that will hear this message. Verse 23, and I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins. That word is translated to the word kidney. The word kidney in Hebrew, ancient language, refers to the will, the affections of a person. He says, I know your affections. I know your will. I know your desires. He said, I also know your hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. One day there's going to be two books open. One book is the Lamb's Book of Life. God already knows whose name is in that book. He knows but because he's just and holy and for the sake of those that will be standing there, he will say, search the book. And they'll look in the book and God will say, your name is not here. And of course, I believe you. some people say they'll be begging God for help and they'll say, oh, please search the book again. And I know there's a song like that. But, you know, I, I kind of believe that God is so holy and just that there's no arguing towards God. When you get to eternity or before, you, you know in your heart whether you're saved or not. You know. You know. And so when God looks in the book and your name's not there, you're not going to be begging, search it again, search it again, because you know it's not there. And God is no liar. God is just and holy and pure, and he will tell you your name's not found. But those that their name is found, there'll be another book that he'll open. It'll be the book that... You can call it the book of works, the book of service, whatever you want to call it. And it's 
for those that's been saved. And it's a book that records every act of service or work that you've done for Jesus since you've been saved. It'll be recorded what you did and also why you did it. He will search not only what you did, but he will search, as he says here, in verse number, what, 22 or 23, he's going to search why you did it. What is, what is the reins in the heart of this person? What was their will? What was their affection? Some people come to church today just because it's, well, I'm supposed to. Well, I appreciate that you believe that, but it, you should be here because you want to. You desire to. And sometimes we teach Sunday school because we know it's the right thing to do. Well, that's good, but it needs to go a step farther. We do it because we love Jesus. And we love people we're teaching. And those that have done any work for Jesus and it was not done with the right motive, the right spirit, and the right intentions, those works will burn like hay and stubble. Completely burn up. And there'll be no reward. And he says here to this church, he says to them, he says, you repent. He says, because I'm going to judge you according to your works. I'm going to judge you according to your works. My question to you this morning. First of all, are you saved by the grace of God? Do you know the S-O-N, Jesus Christ? Do you know him as your personal Savior? They were worshiping some of these people at Thyatira in the city there. They were worshiping the creation and not the creator. The Bible says we're living in those days where they'll praise the creation and they'll turn their back and deny the creator. Those that worship creation will die and go to hell. Those that have met personally the creator and placed their faith in his death, his burial, his resurrection will live in heaven forever. Amen. Jesus said, I am the S-O-N of God. Yes, right. By me all things were made, and by me all things consist. All right. Without the S-O-N, there would be no S-U-N. Really? When it seems like the S-U-N is not shining, you just remember the S-O-N is still shining bright. Amen. Amen. Still shining bright. And he says to this church, he says, you've worked hard, You've really worked hard, but yet your motive's not right. You did it for the wrong reasons. You did it with intentions that are not holy, intentions that are not pure. He says you need to examine your heart. Number one, am I saved? Number two, am I serving the Lord? Am I working for the Lord? Number three, the work that I'm doing for the Lord or the works that I'm doing for God are they being done with the right motive? Are they being done with the right spirit? Are they being done with the right intentions? I want to tell you today with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, please bow your head and close your eyes as Miss Sarah comes and gets ready to play softly an invitational hymn. I beg you, church, I beg you that are, that are listening through the sermon audio, wherever you may be, whether it be United States, all the way over to China, Taiwan, Canada, wherever it may be, I beg each and every one of you to allow the Holy Spirit of God to search the reins and the harp. And see, first of all, have I been born again? Am I really saved? Or am I playing church? Am I playing Christian? If you need to be saved, you, you need to do it today. Today's the day of salvation. Amen. Number two, now that I'm saved, I should be serving the Lord. I should be working. Look at the great work he did for me. Really? The great work at Calvary that he did for me. How can I, how can I sit on the pew of do nothing and not serve and work for him who gave so much for me? Then number three, we need to ask the Lord to examine our heart. We that are serving, we that are working, are you doing it with the right intentions? Really? Are you doing it for the right motives? May God give us a church full of people that would serve Jesus with all their heart.
with all their mind, with all their soul. And they'll do it because they love Jesus Christ. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, as our congregation now stands to its feet, I pray that in Jesus Christ's name you'd be honored what's said and done today. I pray, Lord, those that are here that's, Lord, been privileged, they have been privileged to hear the Word of God this morning. Lord, even those, Lord, around the world that will hear this message, I pray that in Jesus Christ's name that you would deal with hearts. Lord, we pray for those that are lost, never been saved by your grace. They've rejected you over and over again. I pray you'll deal with their heart. God save them for it's too late. Lord, we know that less and less we hear about people really getting saved and, and showing fruits of real repentance. We know that, Lord. We know, according to the Bible, there's a great falling away. And, Lord, it's sad what's going on today around the world. But, Lord, yet it's exciting because we know that your coming is very near. Because you said these things must happen before you appear in the eastern sky. So we glorify you that your prophecy, your will is being, Lord, played out every single second of every single day we live. We pray, Lord, for those, Lord, that work, but yet their work is not with the right motive, the right intention. Please deal with their heart. Help them to do it because they love you. They do it because they want to, not because they have to. Lord, they do it because they want to, not because they need to. Lord, it's, it's good that we have to, and it's good, Lord, that we need to, Lord, but we want to do it because we want to. Please help us, God. Lord, bless those that are around the altar, those that are praying in the pew. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Miss Sarah's played. If you need to continue to pray, don't, you don't have to hurry at all. I, I'm, I'm never going to get in a hurry during invitation time. This is your time. You pray as long as you need to pray. You may can't get around this altar. You're praying in your pew. Please don't have your mind on anything else but except what was preached. How could we hear a message like that from the Lord? How can we examine the church of Thyatira and see what God was warning them about? what they were, so many of those in the church were practicing. They were trying to get ahead, but yet by falling away from what's right, they were getting farther behind. How often in our own lives we think that if we don't do this, we think that we're going to get ahead. If we do this, we'll get ahead. We won't witness to that business partner, to that uh, co-worker, that employee or employer because we want to get ahead. We want to get that promotion. We want to get that raise. We want to keep our jobs. And so because of what we won't do, we think we're getting ahead, but yet we're falling behind spiritually. We're living in disobedience to God. God may help all of us that we'll understand what the truth is. We we'll understand what is right. We understand that we need to please the Lord. So often I see people try to, they'll want to hold their tithe and offering back because they'll say, I want to get ahead, preacher. I've got to catch up. I've got to get ahead. But yet they're falling behind because it's disobedience to God. Others say, well, preacher, I'm going to get another job and I won't be there on Sundays anymore and I just got to get ahead. I need, I need more. I, 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 my neighbor's got this, and I want that. And I, I, it's not just to pay bills, but it's just to get a little more money in the pocket. And they use that to justify where they're missing church, but yet they're getting more behind. They're not getting ahead. They're getting farther and farther behind. God, help us to understand this message, to understand this letter. The only thing that we've done for Christ and we've done it with a pure motive, is the only thing that will last. That's right. Nothing else will last except what we did with Christ and for Christ. Amen. That's what will last through all eternity. Lord, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for those, Lord, that's allowed me to...
bring them the Word of God again today. I pray you'll use the message for thy glory. Help us as we go our separate ways. I pray that you would bless the offering today. I pray, Lord, that Lord, that you'll bless those that give and that you would allow us to use it for your glory. Thank you for the nursery worker. Thank you for the children's church worker. Thank you, Lord, for Brother Adams, Lord, for allowing this message, Lord, to be used in other places where there's not a good Bible-believing church, where the truth is, is not there. Thank you, Lord, that we can be part of that. Lord, help us as we go our separate ways. Touch us, dear God, we beg you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Thank you so much for listening to the sermon today. We hope and pray that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible says in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says in John chapter number 14 that Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Our prayer here at Open Door Baptist Church is that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, Jesus Christ loves you. He died for you, and He's more than capable and more than willing to cleanse you from unrighteousness and from your sins and make you a child of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The Bible says if you repent, turn from your sin and turn to Jesus Christ and by faith believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection for your salvation, you too can be saved. Our prayer is that you think upon this and that very soon you'll make an eternal decision to receive Jesus as your personal Savior. Thank you so much.